بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم. The question that I was presented with is how does your faith or congregation address environmental concerns? Um, at first, I took the topic at face value. I converted it in my talk to how does Islam address environmental concerns. And as I was going through the, you know, putting together my notes, and I actually first um, created a talk like this about 10 years ago. Um, a few members from our congregation or from our community created something called the Muslim Green Team um, to start becoming a little more active in environmental issues. And so we put together some speaker points and some speaker notes if someone wanted to give a sermon on the topic. And so I was going through that old talk and I realized the title I had given it was a little misleading. Um, how does Islam address environmental concerns? The faith itself doesn't necessarily address environmental concerns, because environmental concerns are contemporary and changing. Uh, what the faith does, I think, is contextualize how to think about the environment and give us principles so that people can address environmental concerns, right? Muslims address environmental concerns. So in the beginning of this, I'm going to try to put a context for uh, how does Islam think about the environment? What are some of the principles we have within our faith? that are connected to concerns about the environment. And then at the end, talk about as Muslims and as people, how can we address, address environmental concerns? And I think even my personal perspective has changed over the past 10 years, especially given some recent, I, I think this topic is now really pressing, given some of the press that um, uh, Greta Thunberg, for example, has gotten in, her activism and other young climate activists. Uh, I'm learning a lot and I think my own perspective on the issue is changing. So to give you some context, first I'm going to talk about the place of nature itself in consciousness of Muslims and in the faith of Islam. Um, I will also talk about some Islamic principles that directly address the environment and then maybe some ideas about how we address environmental concerns. Um, in a sense, as Muslims, we believe we have a very primordial connection to the earth. We have a creation story, and I'm sure, so she asked for a show of hands, all of you have attended religion uh, chat, is that what it's called, before. So I'm assuming some basic background knowledge of principles and uh, some, some basics of Islam. If not, um, we'll ask. Sure, sure. <laughs> and, and please do, you know, I'm a, um, what I get paid for is I'm a professor of um, philosophy at a college, and so I don't do a lot of lecturing. I do a lot of questioning and then picking apart people's answers. So I'm very happy with um, interruptions and questions, so feel free. Um, so in Islam, we do have a creation story, and we have a story that Adam was created from Earth. And in fact, you may have heard this story before, but there's this exchange where uh, God creates Adam and asks the angels and um, another being, um, his name is Iblis, to show respect and bow to what he has just created, to bow to Adam. And Iblis refuses because he is what we call a, a jinn. I don't know if that translates to genie or not, but it's another type of creation uh, similar to angels, um, except that jinn also have free will, like human beings. So anyway, um, God asks the angels and Iblis to bow to Adam, and Iblis refuses and says, I made a fire and he's made of clay, like I'm superior. So we, as Muslims, we cite this as sort of the first instance of racism or prejudice, um, right? That I'm, I'm created different and I'm superior. But the, and we, that's a whole other talk. Um, but the idea is that we are made from the earth. We are made from clay. And so in that sense, as Muslims, we consider ourselves to have this very primordial, um, uh, very um, organic, connection to the earth. Um, and there's another very famous um, uh, quote from the prophet Muhammad. Um, it's called the Hadith, which is a saying of the prophet, where he says, the earth has been made for me and my followers a place of praying and a thing to perform um, cleansing. Therefore, my followers can pray wherever uh, the time of prayer is due. Meaning that when we pray, and you know that Muslims are asked to pray five times a day in ritual prayer, although we can supplicate 24-7. Um, there's, there's certain conditions we 
we clean ourselves, we need to be praying in a clean place. Uh, there's a saying from the Prophet that says explicitly that the whole, the entire earth is pure and clean as a place of prayer. So, it's interesting, I brought a copy of this book. I actually brought three extra copies, in case anyone would like one. It's called Green Dean, and Dean is, uh, Dean is sort of the Arabic word for faith or way of life or religion. And the quote on the back is a translation of this, the earth is a mosque. And the author talks about the first time, you know, he was a kid growing up in Brooklyn in New York, a uh, sort of inner city black Muslim kid. And when he was five years old for the first time, his dad took him out on a hike in, in some nearby hills and, lay, and said, oh, it's time to pray. We're going to pray here. And the boy said he had never conceived of prayer outside of his place of worship or his home. And when his father recited this quote, that the entire world is pure as a place of prayer, it really struck him and was very um, sort of foundational in forming his ideas about his faith and the environment. When I was first learning about Islam, um, so I didn't grow up in a Muslim family, I grew up in a Hindu family. And when I was in college, I started learning about Islam. And I read this book called um, Islam, ideals and realities. And the author was talking about what it means to be Muslim and what the word Islam means. I'm sure a lot of you know what the word Islam means, or the connotation, yeah. <laughs> peace, um, and also submission, so the connotation is achieving peace through submission to the will of God. He framed it very wonderfully. He said, if you think about it, all of creation is in submission to God. And in fact, <clears throat> there is a verse from the Quran, our holy book, that says, and unto God falls in prostration whatever is in the heavens and earth, willingly or unwillingly, and so do their shadows in the mornings and in the afternoons. And, you know, this is an idea that early Muslim philosophers developed sort of in the medieval times, and then actually you'll find some similar, like, echoes of this philosophy in later Christian philosophers, like, um, especially Aquinas. Um, where they talk about the idea that all of nature is in, is in submission to God. Human beings are the ones that have the choice whether or not to submit to the will of God, right? So a tree won't say, I don't feel like bearing fruit. I just choose not to, right? Or something, I choose not to emit light today. You know, the sun isn't going to choose to emit. They do what they were created to do, and they don't have a choice over that. And to an extent, there are certain functions in our own body that we don't have a choice after choice over, right? But early Muslim philosophers understood that we do have this extra element of choice, whether or not to submit to what God, how God wants us to live, um, and submit to the will of God. And so this author was explaining that then by submitting to the will of God, by being a Muslim in that sense, the linguistic sense of being a submitter, you are essentially putting yourself in harmony with the rest of the universe. And so in that sense, Nature is almost our role model that we want to follow in terms of being in submission and a reminder to us um, to remain in submission. And then there's another, another concept that contextualizes the role of nature in Islam. Um, all of you know the, the holy book for Muslims. What is it called? The Quran. Again, early Muslim scholars said we actually have two holy books. And some of you may say, oh, you know, the Sunnah or the Hadith. But that's not what they were talking about. They say we have two holy books. One is the revealed book, the Quran, that was given to us by God through the Prophet Muhammad, revealed through Angel Gabriel. So that you know about. They said we have another book. It's called the Displayed Book. And what, what scholars were referring to was nature itself, the environment itself. And the idea was that, yes, God has revealed to us this book, and in it are lessons that we take and we learn from it. But God has also given us this other book to learn from, and that is the world around us. And if you actually, perhaps many of you have opened up the Quran and flipped through it a little bit, you'll see that there's so many um, reminders related to nature and the environment. So God will constantly be asking us in the Quran to look to the sun and the moon, look to the oceans, look to the trees, look to the crops. In fact, there's a specific verse where 
those who are skeptical of this new message are asking the Prophet Muhammad, are you telling us that we're going to die and then come back to life? Right? The idea of resurrection. This is, they're saying this is crazy. And God is asking us, do you see your crops? That they grow and then they appear to die and then they come back to life? And in fact, I mean, kids are such wonderful teachers. When my daughter was born, and we were in this house that, that we're living in, you know, in the winter, the tree would look like it's dead. And she's like, Mommy, did the tree die? I said, no, no, it's just winter. She says, but it's totally, it looks totally dead. There's no leaves, there's no nothing, it's just sticks. And I said, just wait and watch. And then in the spring, it blossoms again. Right? She's like, wow, how did it come back to life? Right? So in the Quran, God is constantly reminding us that, yes, I have given you this book as a source of revelation, as a source of guidance, but you also have all of this around you to guide you also to God. And early Muslim philosophers said that we were given the book, but we were also given our brain in order to come to those same conclusions if we really looked around us with an open heart and open mind, that we would come to those same conclusions. And what's interesting actually is that, you know, we translate the sentences, I guess, within the Quran as verse, but the Arabic word for that is actually does anyone know? Ayah. So the Arabic word for that is an ayah. And this is the difficulty of translating certain concepts from one faith to another, one language to another. An ayah literally means, who knows? A sign. A sign. Yeah, so when we were given the Quran, the word for those individual sentences is not sentence or verse, right? Because verse implies ayah, which means a sign. And it's the same thing that we refer to when we see a sign in nature, a sign from God. So there, there's a, there's a, you know, a, a matching up here between the book that God has given us in the world and the book that has been revealed to us. So that, that's sort of to contextualize what a central role the world and the environment plays um, in our faith. Then there are some specific principles that can help us maybe address specific environmental concerns. Um, one is this idea of stewardship. And I know that this is not a concept specific or unique to um, the faith of Islam. Um, but when God created humans, the understanding is that we have been created as stewards of the earth. And there's a verse, I will read it, although it's, um, it's a little bit lengthy, but I think it's important. And this is in the 14th chapter of the Quran. It says, it is God who has created the heavens and earth and sends down rain from the skies. And with it brings up fruits with which we feed you. And it is he who has made the ship subject to you, that you may sail through the sea by his command. And the rivers has he made subject to you. And he has made subject to you the sun and the moon, both diligently pursuing their courses. And the night and the day has he also made subject to you. And he gives you all that you ask for. But if you count the favors of God, you will never be able to count them or to number them. So obviously we don't, some of these things we don't control, literally, so we don't control the sun and the moon. But the idea here is that God has given us these things in nature, these favors, and some element of control, some element of being able to harness it to our own benefit, right? And I think we're becoming more and more conscious of the fact that for better or worse, we have harnessed a lot of what God has given us for our own benefit, sometimes at the detriment of the health of Earth itself, which we'll talk about maybe a little bit later. Um, but with that power, to quote Spider-Man, or Spider-Man's uncle, with great power comes great responsibility, right? So with the power that we have been given to harness these things, we are all, that, that's the idea of stewardship. That you have power over something, but the power is to care for something. Right? You are giving temporary power over something to make sure that you take good care of it and that it's still there when whoever it belongs to comes back. Right? So, you know, we have this concept, Muslims have this concept about everything we're given, including our own bodies, including our money, which is why we have rules. You know, my son, so my son is seven years old. He'll be seven on Saturday. And last year he started a business because he thought I wasn't buying him enough Legos. Or he wanted more Legos. And I said, I, you have plenty of Legos, you need to practice gratitude, right? So we're going through all this. He said, well, I want more. I said, well, buy them yourself. He says, how do I get money? I said, well, you either have to have a job 
or start a business. He says, well, I want a job. Oh, you're a little too young for a job. So he started a business, and he made money. And I should have preemptively talked about this with him. Um, but I said, okay, he, you know, he, got, he made his first sale, and I said, well, hold on. First, you need to take away the costs, right, of whatever it costs to make your product. He wraps chocolates and custom wrappers and sells them. So like, you have to pay for the chocolate and the labels and mommy's ink, right? So you need to pay for those things. And then we put some away for savings. We put some away for charity. And then the rest you can have. So he was in tears. Why are you doing this to me? I was like, wait till he gets his first paycheck. <laughs> I was like, hey, this isn't the salary you told me I was going to get. Um, anyway, so in tears, and I, I really should have talked to him about this at first, but we went through this conversation. He says, well, it's my money. I can do what I want with it. It's my money, right? And we had this conversation that nothing you have is yours. Yes, it's yours in a sense, but God has given us the ability to use these things for our benefit, that this is God's money that he's letting you have for a little while. Same thing with our body, right? Our body is ours to use on this earth, but we have a responsibility to take care of it. And so everything we're given, we have the stewardship over, responsibility to take care of it. And because of that, we owe certain responsibilities to somebody. So out of our money, we owe, we, we believe in our faith that you owe a responsibility to those who don't have the same privileges and haven't been put in the same kind of position to be able to make as much money. So same thing with the earth, that it's a, it's a stewardship. Yes, we can harness it for our use, but we are really caretakers, and we have to take that as a serious responsibility. Secondly, there's another really beautiful saying from the prophet. When he's, he says, when doing the ablution, which is the ritual uh, washing that we do before each of the uh, ritual prayers, the five prayers, he says, do not waste even if you are using water from a flowing river. And if you think about it, it's pretty profound, because what he's saying here is that even if you have a flowing river, even if there's plenty, don't waste. Because sometimes the way we frame environmental concerns is we're running out of it, so start conserving it. As opposed to changing just the attitudes of people that we just shouldn't have an attitude of wastefulness. Even if there's a ton of it, it's just not a good attitude to be wasteful. And even in the Quran, there's a verse where God says, waste not by excess, for God loves not the wasters. That just the attitude of wastefulness is not becoming a person of faith. Why do you think that is? I'm going to know philosophy teacher mode. <laughs> why, why is the attitude, what does the attitude of wastefulness have to do with faith? Selfishness and greed. Selfishness and greed. If you're, if you're wasteful, you're shallow. Stewardship. You're shallow, you're not, you know, you're just on the top of it. Right, you're right. Thinking. You're not living. Right, right. Other ideas? Sharing. Sharing. Community. Right, community. I'm learning. What else? Also, like, ingratitude, right? I mean, like, if somebody gives you a gift, and I'm, you know, you have to sometimes teach your kids this because they don't know it. Like, you have to teach them manners when they're really little. So I'm still on the stage, obviously, where I have little kids. So I'm, you know, going through this right now. But they don't always know manners. So my son got a gift from someone he already had. It was a Lego set. He already had it, of course. And he gets the gift, and he's like, "Oh, I already have this." And I had to talk to him about it. I said, "You say thank you. You say you really appreciate it and you love it, and we will take care of that later." if you already have it, right? But when someone gives you a gift, you express gratitude, right? You don't waste it. You don't say, oh, thanks, throw it in the garbage, right? Or whatever, you really, you're, you, you cherish it, and you use it well, you use it nicely. So in, along those lines, if God has given us this gift of the earth, we're not gonna be wasteful with it. We're gonna be grateful, right? So this attitude of wastefulness sort of comes to the core of the character someone of faith should have, or we should be engendering. Um, and then there's other specifics. I, I'm not necessarily going to get into all the details because there's going to be a Q and A. And I, how much time? Another minute. We'll have five minutes left for questions. Okay. All right. 
So there are some specific um, exhortations within the faith about how we care for the earth, how we care for animals. Um, you know, quickly within the faith, there are some rules about even if you're engaged in a battle, for example, a war, there are certain things that are off limits. So even if you're in a war in a, in a certain area, you leave alone places of worship, any place of worship, not just your own. But you also don't root, uproot trees, you don't harm animals, you don't harm crops, which when I first learned I thought was very sort of strange because you don't think of people being in battle and then being like, wait, let's go around the tree or let's go around the crops, right? But this is within the rules that you don't damage infrastructure, people of faith, but also like um, the environment. You don't damage the environment. And then in Islam, um, there are vegetarian Islams. It's not, it's not um, an Islamic principle. But the practice of early Muslims also, they didn't eat a lot of meat. And there are a lot of, um, a lot of incidents in the life of the Prophet where he pointed to people who Otherwise, we're sort of shunned from society. There's an incident of a, a prostitute in, in the community, so she was sort of shunned. And she saw a dog that was dying of thirst, and she took off her slipper and went to the well, took out water, and gave the dog some water. And he said, because of that, she's going to go to heaven. It's right? so the idea that we care, for, we care for these creatures. So I'll, I'll wrap it up and allow some time for questions, but I, I said I would address this last question that, um, or the topic, so how do, how do Muslims address environmental concerns? And I wanted to propose, again, because I said my views on this have changed, where a lot of the talk is what do we do personally in our lives, and I've been learning a lot recently, and you know some of the statistics out there, that 100, 100 companies are responsible for 71% of global emissions since 1988. And there's been a lot of talk that by telling people to change their habits, it's almost victim shaming, right? Like we're the ones suffering from these effects, and then you're telling the people you should change. And we should because, you know, in the context of what we've said, we do it because we care. But if you want an effective solution to the problem, individuals aren't really the main problem. Um, and so I just want to end with um, another saying of the Prophet Muhammad. And he says that whosoever of you sees something wrong, let him change it with his hand. And if he is not able to do so, then let him change it with his tongue. And if he is not able to do so, then within his heart. And that is the weakest of faith. Or not the weakest, it's a bad translation, but like the minimum. Right? And I, I see this saying as the context for our civil engagement and social justice within Islam. That if we see something, then we have to do something to address it. And based on the facts, we can change our personal habits, but it's really going to take a community of people to come together and advocate for those who are actually causing the problem to change to change their habits. So I think we have maybe three minutes left for questions. I didn't know I was going to talk that long. Yes. So I would like that list of those 100 companies so I can boycott them. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so I'll, give you the, I'll give you the study. I can give you the, um, the reference for the study. Great. And I'm sure if you did an internet search, you would also find it. And it's interesting because, um, again, boycotting is effective if it's a mass boycott, right? Uh, so I'm not a policy person. I teach philosophy. I'm sort of on the opposite <laughs> end of the spectrum. My husband's a social worker, so he's very action-oriented. Um, but certainly, I think it takes it's going to take some mass advocacy. But in order for people to act, they have to know and they have to care, right? Mm -hmm. So I think a lot of us know, and we could stand to know more. I think a lot of us, our faith or our other principles encourage us to care. Um, and then the next step is to act. And hopefully we can, as a community, come together to do that. Other, other questions? Yeah. Uh, I want you to address um, the importance of water in Islam. You know, it's one of the, it's interesting. It's, Oh, the importance of water, of water in Islam. Um, oh, so off the top of my head, um, I can say that there is a constant, there are so many metaphors in the Quran that use water. Um, it, it, 
It's used to describe, of course, bodies of water, and it asks us to look at different bodies of water to take lessons from things. It talks about two rivers joining. This is interesting. There's a verse in the river that says, uh, in the Quran, it says when two rivers join, there's a barrier and the water doesn't mix. And people say that's crazy. Of course you put water together, it mixes. But if you've been at the border of like salt and fresh water, you see that there is a border. So there's a lot of things like that in the Quran that are telling us to please, uh, to, to look at water, to observe the miracle that God has given us. There's a lot about rain, about the life-giving force of rain. And in fact, and this is, um, Again, a whole other topic, but the word Sharia, which is often misunderstood and could be a whole other topic, was actually used by Arabs even before Islam to mean the path that you take to find water. And Islam as a religion that was founded in an area, in fact, you know, this sort of the three monotheists traditionally viewed as monotheistic religion, Judaism, Christianity, Islam, all started in places where there was, there was a desert. Water was so important. And so the word Sharia meant like the road you take to find the closest body of water. So there's a lot of metaphors and a lot of signs that have to do with water in the faith. Um, there's not a specific thing in the Quran that says preserve water, um, but it's, it's included in, in everything and definitely presented as a big miracle or blessing that, that God has given us. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. I've been here a uh, few times previously talking. This time, hopefully, the acoustics are going to be nice, so you'll be able to hear me. <clears throat> so, I'm going to begin with a chant, and I'll uh, describe what it is later. And uh, then I'll talk about the Hindu perspective of uh, Bhagavad Gita. So, please close your eyes if you'd like to accompany me. I'll just chant in Sanskrit, I will describe it. Om Dhau Shanti Ranta Riksha Shanti Prithivi Shanti Rabah Shanti Roshadaya Shanti Vanaspataya Shanti Vishvedeva Shanti Brahma Shanti Sarvagum Shanti Shanti Rev Shanti Sama Shanti Revi So the reason we're discussing the environment of course is that uh, environmental disasters are all around us um, and we are anticipating all manner of changes in the environment and so we have we're concerned concern about the damage that we're causing to the environment and the sort of behavior that our behavior that is you know, causing this damage what system of thought and what pattern of behavior might alter this and bring things back into that's the, the, the reason why we're discussing the environment. And involved in this are topics of consumerism, which is the fact that our economies are driven by an earn and spend model where you earn to spend, and consumerism is a big thing. The hyper-individualization of uh, society is another reason for this consumerism. And a uh, lack of perception of interconnectedness between things. I, because of this individualization, because of this lack of perceiving the entire system at one go, we see it um, only in parts. And this lack of connection uh, forces us to see things differently, which is a problem. And a lack of a system of communicating values and traditions and habits to the younger generations as they come in. So they learn the wrong things because we don't know how to transmit the right. So really, it's really um, a choice between a few uh, sort of combinations of things that we have to think about. One is, uh, how does the society look at the spiritual and the sacred? Which is, how do you see beyond just the material that is available to you and see everything in a, in a divine light? So that's the first conversation we ought to have. The second is, how do you see the whole system and how it works in synchrony? 
how different pieces work, how things work in harmony. And the third is, uh, like the previous speaker very elegantly pointed out, this how do you inculcate a sense of selflessness and not stealing from future generations for your own enjoyment. So to recap, spiritual and sacred is the first thing that we ought to discuss. The second is seeing the entire system at one go, hopefully. Uh, seeing the entire system at one go and being able to act in synchrony with the system itself. The third, of course, is uh, being selfless and not stealing from future generations. Those are the things that we like to discuss when we discuss what each faith, uh, what each faith's perspective on this whole thing is. Now, <clears throat> now uh, the Hindu faith comes as a sort of unbroken faith over thousands of years and comes from a place of seven rivers. So this is a place of abundance. It's not a place where there's a desert like you were pointing out. And, and so the thinkers here had time to think about um, uh, abundance and how to conduct yourself in a time where everything is available. And yet you must know how to uh, safeguard the system, make sure that the water is running fine, the you know, society is running OK. And so the, the early songs of this tradition, the Hindu tradition, were not about um, as much about God. They were about God, but the earliest memories that we have in verse are not about God as much as they are about order. Now, uh, the word in the first way, which is the first book, first of the four Vedas, where there's the same word as video, which is to see. So when you see, you have a revelation, you sing, and you write it down, you know, many thousands of years later when you have a script. So the first way um, is, is a, explores the idea of rhythm very uh, deeply. Ritha, R-T-A is the word, Ritha. Now that word is still around, it echoes and reverberates through societies, and you know that word as my right hand, you know that word as being righteous, you know that word as, um, as um, what else, uh, rhythm. The flow of things, how does everything work? Um, and I give this talk and I promised myself I would not say it, but you know, here I am, I'm saying it again. Who ripens the avocado? You buy those avocados from Costco, they're live grenades, you throw it at someone and you know they'll send the cops after you uh, because you know you're obviously causing damage. But a couple of months later, you know, given Costco batch, two months maybe, it ripens and it's like ripe enough. It seems like two months, it might be two weeks, you know. I'm never sure. But who ripens the avocado? Now they didn't have avocados then, but they still thought about what makes everything work, right? What is the inherent order behind things? And this sense of order let them do uh, two more words. And then that unfolded into what you might think of the Hindu concept of God. But the next words were dharma and karma. Now dharma is interesting. Dharma is what glues everything together. It's the, next, the relationships we have with each other. Um, me with my family, me with my society, me with the world at large. What is my duty towards you? And what is my relationship with you? Very complex word. But all of this comes back from the original search for order, rhythm. And once you start thinking about order, you realize that everything is connected. And when you realize everything is connected, you realize that you cannot have piecemeal peace, two different words. You cannot have word peace in just one aspect of your existence. You ought to have peace in every aspect. So the words I chanted to you had the following meaning translated into English. <clears throat> may the heavens bring us peace. May peace be with the skies and may the skies shower us with peace. May there be peace on earth and may the earth mother bring us peace. May there be peace with the waters, and may the waters bring us peace. May there be peace in the herbs, and may the herbs bring us peace. May peace be with the trees, and may the trees bring us peace. Peace be with the divinities of the world, and may they, be, and may they bless us with peace. May the great Lord of the universe bless us with peace, and may the Veda inspire us with peace. May all existence be at peace, and may peace come from all existence to all. May there be peace only, universal peace for all. 
May that heavenly peace come and bless me, may it bless all. This is a result of thousands of years of thinking about how things work and realizing that you cannot have something for yourself unless everyone has some of that same thing. And so when you want peace for yourself, you can't just have peace for yourself, you gotta share with everybody else because only then when, is, when there's peace all around, can you have some of it. And so this interconnected of everything is rooted in the Hindu belief. And so our gods, you might think of Hindus as having many, many gods, uh, they do not have precedence over this order. This order precedes everything. Even the gods, uh, even the minor gods that you might think of, have to follow order. And so the order precedes everything understanding and becoming one with that order is a core part of the Hindu belief system. Where we've understood that through experience and through you know through meditation we've come to this conclusion. So everything for Hindus is sacred. A um, couple of months ago I went with my family to the source of the two of the seven rivers. Two of those rivers we went in the Himalayas and we went to the source not at the glacier which was melting but uh, just at the base of the glacier we went there and there are temples to those rivers. Those rivers are not merely bodies of flowing water. They are holy rivers and they are divinity in their own right. They have temples and I went with my family to that temple and we prayed at the temple. We, we, and we offered our respects to the river. And the interesting thing was this tradition has been around for thousands of years. Books, you know, uh, you know the Vedas talk about places that I, have, I took my family to this summer and the same tradition has gone on. Rivers are sacred to us because they are, of course, the source of life, are they not? And so sacredness is everywhere. And of course, the famous thing with the Hindus is cows are sacred, as everyone knows. And cows are sacred for a variety of reasons, but the one I want to bring to, here, uh, to you here is um, the word for cow in, in Sanskrit is go. And go, go, as in cow, and uh, which is, you know, cognitive of the word cow. Now, uh, Go itself is a multi-multi-purpose word. You use it for different things. Go can refer to the cow. It can refer to the senses, like the five senses. It can refer to the earth itself, and it can refer to the Vedas, the holy books. All of them are referred to at different times as go, and and so treating these as mother is a core part of uh, the Hindu belief system. Whereas the cow is sacred because, of course. Uh, we drink our mother's milk and we drink the cow's milk and by that transference the cow is our mother right? and so the cow is sacred. So sacredness is a very core part of the Hindu tradition. Trees are sacred. If you go to India you're going to see trees have holy threads around them and temples will, will spring out around trees. Trees are sacred. Rivers are sacred. Uh, you know, uh, Many different animals are sacred depending on what your belief system is. Sacredness is everything because the ultimate goal in Hinduism is to see see all of reality as the moving of the sacred. So another uh, another I'm not going to sing it, but uh, the second verse describes that everything everything that moves and that does not move is the God is God Himself. The word we use is Ish in that sense, and so everything is divine. And once you understand that everything is sacred, your behavior with it. With it with all time. Because you now are not only uh, uh, looking after it as a steward, you're also to serve it. Because everything is denied, uh, is, is divine. You cannot, um, you know, you cannot walk um, without approval of those divinities, so to speak. So divinity is important. And so caretaking is very important. And a spirit of sacrifice and uh, surrender is very important when it comes to nature. So I've covered the first we uh, talk about the seeing everything as a system and, and the synchrony of everything. Hindu traditions, and not just the religion itself, but the tradition is very sensitive to, uh, to the goings on around us. So at the temple you see, we're sensitive to the time of day, the placement of the sun, the placement of the moon, um, uh, the placement of the various stars, and the objects that come in, you know, it depends on what's going on there. Uh, things can be consumed when they are ripe, things do not need to be consumed when they are out of season. 
knowing when something is in season and not in season is important. So a lot of the tradition is built in harmony with nature. And a lot of the problems we have are that we're having, I'm having avocados in a time when avocados are not in season. Who knows when they're in season? Costco's are never in season. Uh, so so the, the thing is, uh, re eating ripe fruit, for example, is a core part of you know, how people sort of conduct themselves. Um, another part of the harmony is if you look at a lot of the, uh, the talk now about vegetarianism um, in the West, it's coming out because of an eco-friendliness, because you're saying that you know eating beef has a certain amount of, uh, of carbon footprint, and if you're a vegetarian, then your carbon footprint reduces. Um, Hindus, of, uh, a wide majority of Hindus are mostly vegetarian if they're not fully vegetarian. I'm fully vegetarian. I will have milk, but I don't have meat of any type. And vegetarianism is a core part of you know how Hindu practices are. Hindus eat meat as well. Some of them do. But they're not always eating meat. That's generally the, the consumption pattern. And uh, in general, vegetarian, vegetarianism is accepted. And, and we, are, we know how to make tasty food when it comes to vegetarian food. That's the important part because I see a lot of Western people trying to be vegetarian and within three days giving up because there's nothing you can eat. It's just you know, boiled leaves and who knows what else. It's tasteless, it's not uh, satisfying. You, you know, your stomach is hungry and you crave for proteins. Uh, so if you need to learn vegetarianism, you know, you talk to your Hindu friend and tell you how to make it good food. It's tasty and it's, and it's filling. Uh, so, so the pattern of life that has evolved in the Hindu tradition is in harmony with nature. That's the, the point that I was coming to. Which comes to the third part that I want to come to. I'll talk about it at a little more length. Is... Uh, is the idea of, of understanding the connectedness and the cyclicity of everything. That, that what you do here has an impact on nature and nature has an impact on you. So I'll sing, I'll sing three verses and I'll describe it. This is from the Bhagavad Gita. The Bhagavad Gita is not one of the four Vedas I told you, but it's considered the sum of all the Vedas. And to come back to the cow analogy, the Vedas are considered the cows and the Bhagavad Gita is considered the milk of the, of the Vedas because now you milk everything and the best part of it comes in this book. So I'm going to recite from this book. This is a conversation between uh, uh, you know, God himself, uh, incarnate as Krishna, and talking to Arjuna. This is in the middle of a battlefield and they're having a heated dis debate about philosophy because, you know, what else is there to discuss? <laughs> and here he is describing how to, how to conduct yourself. So I'm going to chant a few more, three verses and such. This is in the voice of Sri Krishna. Yagna shishta shineshina santo Muchyante sarva kilbishai Bhunjate kvagham papa Ye panchat yatma karanat Anna bhavanti bhutani Parjanyadanna sambhava Yagnat bhavati parjanyo Yagna karma samudhava Karma Brahmodhavam Vidhi Brahmakshara Samudhavam Tasmat Sarvakatam Brahma Nityam Yagni Pratishtitam. What he's saying is <coughs> the same thing, the first words is. The saintly who eat the leftovers of a sacrifice are liberated from all sins. But the sinful eat sin who cook food just for themselves. The point of this is that if you're if, if what you do and you consume the labor, you, you create something and you consume it for yourself, you're cooking food for yourself, that's considered not good. Why? Because you're part of the universe. So when you create something, you offer it back to the universe and what you and some part of that you consume for yourself. So the first part is leftovers of a sacrifice is every action that you do is a sacrifice. What you do is is helping the universe conduct itself. And I'll describe that in the next verse. So you're helping the universe work, conduct itself. 
And what it gives you, you receive back as the leftovers from that sacrifice. We call it prasad at a temple. And that's a gift that you receive and you can consume that. But if you make it just for yourself, you are in a sense stealing from the working of the universe because you've created something that the entire universe conspired and collaborated with you to build and you've just put it into your back pocket and walked away. So you are stealing and that's considered not cool. The second part, in continuation, from food are born beings, from rain, food grows, from sacrifice comes the rains, and sacrifice from karma springs. What he's saying is, <clears throat> all beings are born from food. That's pretty obvious. The rains cause the food to grow. But what causes the rains? Sacrifice causes the rains. What kind of sacrifice? Action, doing things selflessly is the sacrifice that causes the rains, that causes the, the I mean, so, so a, a good story that, that I heard about in this context was four boys are you know, sitting in a field and they, uh, they're waiting for the rains so that they can actually till the fields and put the, you know, put, the, uh, put the seeds in. It hasn't rained. So it doesn't rain and a week elapses and they have nothing better to do. This. So they said, well, what are you going to do? It's not raining, but our job is to till the field and put the seeds in. So we're just going to start um, start you know, tilling the field and putting the seeds in. So they start doing their work. So when they start doing their work, the, the peacocks look at them in horror. Because they're saying, wait, this is out of sync. I'm supposed to be dancing because it's raining, and then these people are supposed to be doing this stuff. Now they're doing this stuff. This is ridiculous. I better start dancing. So the peacock starts dancing because, you know, stuff is going on. Now the clouds look on. And the clouds say, wait a minute, there's something wrong with this picture. Why is this fool peacock dancing? I haven't started raining yet. And so, and then the clouds say, well, he's dancing already anyway. I may as well begin to at least thunder. And so it, they began to, to, to do the lightning. And then, and then the, the, the rain god looks upon the clouds and says, now wait a second, why are you doing all this thunder and, and sound? If you're going to do all that, you may as well rain. <laughs> so from your action, even gods change their mind and give you the result. So the entire system works because you're doing your work. And so this understanding, in fact, that that's the next verse. And so the next word is, karma from Brahma arises, knowing that Brahma of the imperishable is born. So, you know, the point of this I'm coming to is, understanding the cyclicity of everything, understanding that the cycle of nature works, and, and you have to act in accordance with it, it waits for you to act. So you must act, and nature will act accordingly. And understanding this relationship that we have with nature, in concordance with nature, is an important part of the Hindu tradition as well. So, uh, to sum up, if you're, if, you know, I, I meet a lot of uh, eco-warriors in some of these talks across town, and you're looking for a, a spiritual vision for the uh, ecology. And, uh, and if you're looking for a spiritual vision for the ecology, which will last you a few thousand years, then it's best to look for a spiritual, spiritual vision that has lasted a few thousand years. Because if it's been around for five to 10,000 years, you know that it has lasted, you know, the Dark Ages, the Middle Ages, all sorts of ups and downs of history. And that tradition can tell you how to think about the sacred and the spiritual, how to think about the interconnected of things, and how to think about not being selfish and stealing from future generations for the sake of your own enjoyment. And with that, I'm done with my talk. <laughs> questions? How are the other questions? Yes. It, it sounds like it's a little different what you're describing and what we've heard about um, Islam and I have a Christian experience and that's that caretaker. Yes. And uh, Islam, Christianity, we're sort of man as humans are put in an in charge kind of position. Uh, am I understanding right that you're describing sort of the human as part of the cycle and far more integrated into it? 
that's very perceptive of you. So that's actually a very interesting thing where a uh, king's job, for example, is to take care of the praja. And praja means anyone, anything that's been born, whether from an egg or from you know a womb or on its own. So the king's job is to take care of everything that is born. Um, humans are not special in that sense in the Hindu tradition. We are part of the system. And our job is to participate in the system in a natural way. Yes. It's not dominion or stewardship. It's a, a, a sense of sacrifice and participation. Very personal. Thank you. I think what, what you said, I mean, is the same in my mind as Muslim as God created the perfect system. And our being caretakers is to kind of understand the system and facilitate it, not abuse it, right? Sure, yeah. So which brings us very close. In oh, yeah, yeah. So this, you were saying the same thing, but with a different, we, we sometimes get fooled by the word caretaker, but I think the caretaker takes care of an existing uh, system that is already perfect. On behalf of. On yeah. behalf of. No, no that, that's, a, that's a fair point, but that's actually right. Now, the actions might be similar. What I was coming to from the Hindu perspective is we arrive at the idea of God from first exploring the idea of order. We infer back that the order must have uh, you know, some sort of ordering entity and the nature of the self, which I'm not going to get into today. Uh, I've talked about it elsewhere uh, in this uh, meeting. But um, so the Hindu concept of order does not require God. It just says there is order because that's how we realize that everything seems to be connected. And a divine will is inferred from that, and a divinity is inferred from that. And that might be the only sort of you know, nitpicking difference. Yes, sir. First of all, thanks to both of the speakers. It's really very stimulating. Can you hear me okay? Yes, I can. Okay. Yes. Um, I'm wondering how, here, let me get your mic. How do you reconcile or, um, this, the philosophy and the religion uh, perspectives? How do you reconcile this uh, being in the uh, aligned with, if you will, the greater order of things, with things like the agricultural revolution, for example, the fundamental kind of transitions that happen, and uh, and with sort of contemporary technology? Is, sure. Help us, could you help me think about how that how that works? If I heard, understood your question right, you're saying that uh, there's order that we've sort of discovered. And in that order is the disruption in the form of human technology, whether it's agriculture or, or modern technology and so on. And what's the Hindu position on that? Is that, is that the question? Yes. Yeah. Um, I think the understanding that the order is supreme, it precedes all the technology, is the important part. And that if we do things that are out of sync with the order, the order will still re reinforce itself. Later in the same book, he says, look, every once in a while when order breaks, I come back and I come back to fix things. So um, order, when it goes out of sync, then a change is required and a change <clears throat> comes about through some disaster or some kind of change intervention. Thank you. Thank you very much.